seeking now the help of the Lord. Let's turn to that Old Testament passage from which we were reading. That's Exodus 17 and taking our text in verse 11. Exodus chapter 17 and taking our text in verse 11. Let's hear again the word of the Lord. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel. It's always so, isn't it? We're in the wilderness here. Without were fightings, within were fears. That was the experience of the apostle. That is the experience of the children of God here and now. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel. Amalek descended from Esau. Amalek, a Semitic people. Amalek, one of the nearest relations of the people of Israel. But so often it is so. It is those who have despised covenant privileges, who have turned their backs upon the truth, who are the most vehement, who are the most hate-filled and aggressive in their rejection of the truth as it is in Jesus. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel. A battle was waged, a battle in which Israel had no choice but to engage. And yet in this battle, we have the extraordinary scene laid out before us. This appeal that is lifted up, it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. Oh, it's not Moses who's winning the victory. I will stand, verse 9, on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. And so we see in this passage that victory comes from God. We see that the victory is God's working. It is of God's authorship. It is to God's glory. If we wish to derive the doctrine of this passage, we may sum it up like this, that the believer must defeat the enemies of the Lord in the strength of God. The believer must defeat the enemies of the Lord in the strength of God. Apart from the strength of God, there is no victory, but only defeat. And have we not had to learn that as believers in our walk through this world? Have we not had to learn that our strength lies only in him? Now, I think the doctrine as I've laid it before you is a simple one and also one that I can trust you to accept without needing any proof. And therefore, for our time tonight, rather than attempt to establish that doctrine to you, I want to draw from it three practical applications for the people of God. In the first place, the call to fight. In the second place, the call to pray. And in the third place, the call to triumph in faith. So firstly then, the call to to fight, the call to fight. Well, the call to fight came from the enemy. It was Amalek that came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. The enemies of the Lord are always aggressive and they are always ready to assault the people of God. It wasn't that Israel had strayed from the path of obedience and therefore were attacked. It was on the path of obedience that they were attacked. It was because of their obedience to God that the enemy was assaulting them. Had they stayed in Egypt, there would be no battle. 
there would be no warfare, but they would still be slaves. So it is in the battlefield that the Christian is found. We can indeed go so far as to call it a mark of grace. The believer will be in the battlefield. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life counseled the Apostle Paul, and we may well take his advice to ourselves, for we too are called upon to fight that fight of faith. Now, it's at the point of faith that the battle comes. It is our faith that the enemy seeks to shake. Amalek did not desire to massacre the entire people of Israel, that would probably be indeed beyond their capacities as a people so vast were the multitude of the Israelites at that time. They wanted to discourage, to drive back, to turn them around so that instead of invading their territory, that Israel would return, shamefaced and defeated into their captivity in Egypt. So it is with the world. The world assaults your faith. If only you would bow in unbelief to the gods of this world. If only you would accept their philosophy and live as they do, there'd be no problem and there'd be no warfare. It's, fa it's faith that's under assault. Said Christ to Peter, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So it was faith that Satan assaulted, but faith that was mightily upheld by the Spirit of God. So here then was a battle in faith. Israel could depend on their own strength. Although they had very great numbers, they had no military training, no military skill, probably very few weapons. They were not equipped in any human sense for the battle before them, but they had a mighty God. They were no doubt fearful and afraid, but yet they trusted in their God. And so it is for the believer in this world. We are quite incapable of defeating Satan on his own terrain. By nature, we are his to lead about by his will. We are under the power of the prince of the air by nature. By nature, we are vulnerable to his temptations, open to his leadings, have no power to resist. But... When God is pleased to plant that seed of faith in the soul, oh, there is something that Satan cannot shift. Oh, it's true, he can greatly undermine the faith of the Lord's people. He can even make the Lord's people to deny their faith for a time. There is a capacity within all of us for grievous, shameful backslidings. And therefore, we need such passages as this to remind us of the call to fight. It is a battlefield. And if you are not conscious at this time of the warfare in your soul, then I would be anxious for you. I would be fearful if you are not aware of temptations, if you are not having to resist some drawing or inclination towards what is wrong. I would fear for you because in that situation, I would fear that you are not conscious of that which you are being tempted towards. The Lord's people will be assaulted. The question is, are we fighting back? Amalek came and fought with Israel. But oh, praise God, Israel fought back. You are called to fight. You are called to resist the devil that he may flee from you. You're called to fight, but to fight in faith. I want you to see that Israel had a leader in this battle. It's our first mention of Joshua. Verse 9, Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Joshua, a younger man. Joshua, a vigorous, strong man. 
Joshua, one in whom Moses had confidence, both as a man of war, but more to the point, as a man of faith. A man to whom he could entrust the leading of Israel in battle. Joshua's very name proclaims his faith. Jehovah is salvation. Oh, what a precious name is the name of Joshua, because it is the same name rendered only in the Greek language, which we know and love the name of Jesus, the New Testament, Joshua. Here, Joshua leads Israel in the battle. He is at the forefront. He is in the midst of the fight. He's bearing the brunt of the enemy's assault. And he is inspiring courage in the people by his courage as the captain of the host. He's leading from the front. And so the Lord, the New Testament Joshua, goes before into the battle. He has already endured all that Satan could bring against him. He's faced the temptations in the wilderness. He has been tried to the limits of human nature and has stood without sin. He has been tried then in a different way with suffering and with anguish and with pain. Firstly, in the prospect of it, the Gethsemane experience. Then in the full experience of it, the Golgotha experience. And through it all, standing and enduring without sin. Do we need courage for the fight? Let us look to the captain, the God-given captain of the Lord's host. Let us look to the heavenly Joshua and see in him our inspiration, our hope, our confidence. We may fight, for we have a great captain who has won and is winning for us the victory. So Joshua did, as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Joshua and the people fighting in the valley below, and above them on the hill, Moses. Why on the hill? Surely to be visible, to be seen. There is significance in the fighting of Joshua at the head of the army, but there is significance in the action of Moses on top of the hill. There he is with the rod of God in his hands, and we seem to understand it that he is holding up the rod of God, holding it up in his two hands before the Lord under heaven to be seen to be visible by the host in the valley fighting below. Moses is there with the rod. Remember that rod. So much significance has attached to that rod. That rod cast down before Pharaoh becoming a serpent, a sign that Moses is a prophet of God. That rod stretched out over the rivers of Egypt, bringing forth blood the sign of God's judgment upon a sinful nation. That rod stretched out over the Red Sea, causing them to part the power of God in salvation, granting a way through even the midst of death itself. That rod stretched out over these same waters to return them again in judgment upon the Egyptian army. That rod is the power of God, symbolizing God's power. And that rod is held up before Israel, visible to all, as an inspiration to them, and as a focus for their faith. As they fought, when they had a moment's respite in the battle, they could look up. And they could see that that same rod, which they had seen with their own eyes, bring forth miracles of salvation and of judgment, that same rod was held up. They could see God is at work here. We go not a-warring at our own charges. 
This is not our choice to fight. It's not our battle. It's God's battle. And it's God's power. And he will have the victory. Oh, we're called to fight. And so it is. The Christian life is a battle. And the Lord's people must fight. It is by resisting the devil. It is by striving against sin. It is by bringing forth a holiness that is utterly alien to our original fallen nature. It is by that that God is glorified in his people. This is his way of salvation, beautifully symbolized in this awesome scene. Here is every believer in the midst of this battlefield, trusting in faith in the power of God to grant victory, yet called to fight. And so you must fight, but you must fight in faith. You must fight believing in the power of God, trusting that he is able. And praise God, that rod assured Israel and our far higher vision by faith. That which we were reading off in Mark chapter 16 of the ascended Christ at God's right hand. The Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. He is the focus for our faith. He is the inspiration for our battle. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. He's up there. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. They went forth to fight, spiritually speaking, to battle in this world for the advance of the kingdom of God and of the cause of Christ. They went forth because he lives, because he is ascended, because he reigns on high. That's the confidence. That's the focus for our faith. Dear friends, here is the great summons of the word of God to fight in faith. Are you resisting the devil and his temptations this day? Are you fighting against the temptations that he is bringing to your soul now and at the present time? Are you trusting in the power of God in the sufficiency of Christ, in his atoning work, as your confidence in that battle. May it be so. Make it so. Fight the good fight of faith. And thus lay hold on eternal life. Here we see then the call to fight. Oh, friends, let us be fighting. Let us be si killing sin, as Owen said, or sin will be killing us. Let us be resisting sin. Let us be resisting the devil. Let us be striving against him in his every temptation. Let us be fighting as those whose confidence is in the power of our God. Here then is the call, firstly, to fight. But secondly, the call to pray. The call to pray. It came to pass, verse 11, when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. The word prayer is not mentioned in the scene which we have before us, and yet it is so evident that this is what is going on. It's indicated in the first place by the posture, the arms uplifted to the heavens. The very posture implies appeal. It is a stretching up of man to God, made visible, made outward by that action. 
It's a particular kind of prayer. You think even you children who are here, you see a prayer like that, don't you? Every service of public worship you attend, a prayer indicated by the hands being uplifted. A benediction. A prayer. I've heard preachers say, a benediction is not a prayer, but a blessing. But with all due respect to these preachers, I do not know what they mean. I do not see the distinction to which they point. What blessing can man pronounce in this world except that which is humbly sought from God? What blessing can be presumed upon in this world unless it be presumed upon on the basis of the promises of Scripture pled before God? And is that not what we do in the benediction? We lift our appeal to God that he would bless as he has blessed his people down the generations in the very words of the promise of Scripture. We pray our benediction to be upon us. And so Moses here is engaged in benedictory prayer. He is seeking the blessing from God. And so his hands are uplifted. But they're not empty hands. He is holding the rod of God. Now, it's true that the rod had the significance for Pharaoh of proving that Moses was who he said he was, but it had a more personal significance to the Lord's people as well. The rod of God also proved that Moses was a prophet of Jehovah. The rod of God was Moses's proof that he was sent from the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The rod itself symbolized the faithfulness of God. So as Moses held up the rod before his God, what was he doing but pleading the covenant faithfulness of God? What was he doing but lifting his appeal on the basis of that covenant which God had sworn that he would give the land of the Amalekites to Israel? The promise was being pled. The covenant was being brought before God. Here's true prayer. Here's solemn awesome wrestling with God. Here is a man bringing the word of God back to God. Here is a man asking God to follow through upon his word and upon his promise. It's an awesome thing, but it is an act of faith. Moses lifts up the rod to God because he trusts and believes God is faithful. He is faithful that promised. And so he lifts his appeal symbolically, outwardly, by the uplifted arms, by the uplifted rod, that God will follow through in faithfulness upon his promise. And so he does. So he does. The Lord's people pray the promises of Scripture. They bring the very Word of God back before their Master. They cry to God on the basis of the Word that He would act and that He would bring forth fruit in the lives of His people and gather unto Himself such as should be saved. That is why we strive to use the very words of Scripture in our prayers. We depend upon God's faithfulness. But there's something deeper, of course, going on in this scene. 
it's not simply a man that we see here. Moses has a prophetic function here. He is a powerful type, a prophetic picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was the great mediator of Israel, their go-between. He was bringing the word of God to the people. He was functioning as a prophet. But he was also representing the people to God. He was both prophet and priest. And here we see Moses performing a priestly function. Here we see him as the great intercessor. He is representative of Israel. And as Israel's representative, he lifts a prayer of intercession to God. He stands upon the hill, the mediator between God and man, interceding that God would grant the victory. Oh, dear friends, do we not see Jesus Christ in his priestly work here? Do we not get a sight into eternity of the awesome work of the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven on our behalf, representing us, his people, as the great apostle and high priest of our profession? Do we not see Christ here lifting up a people before God and seeking the blessing from God, which he is pleased to grant? Do we not have an awesome vision then of Christ in his intercessory work? Oh, there's no greater encouragement to prayer than to think about Christ's intercession. The saint's prayer, says Brooks, is as an arrow put into the bow of Christ's intercession. It is Christ's intercession that causes the arrow to pierce the heaven. It is Christ's intercession that makes the prayers of the saints effectual, that grants to them a blessing that brings forth for them the victory. It is on the basis of Christ's intercession that we can look with holy confidence for an answer to our prayers. What a beautiful sight then we have of our mediator in this scene. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. Oh, we falter and fail in our prayers, but how precious to remember that we have one who continually, without fail, prays and prevails, whose prayer goes forth on that unanswerable basis, the sufficiency of his blood, the eternal covenant sworn, the certain promise, therefore, of God. Christ pleads the promises before God and never without effect. And Christ is our great high priest, and we may trust in him. But the greatest expression of all of that trust is that we will pray ourselves. Prayer is faith expressed. Prayer is faith spoken. It is prayer put into effect by our trust in God. And so when we pray, we believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When we pray, we trust. It's not our prayers that will merit or deserve or earn any blessing or portion from God, but it is the mercy of a holy God who is pleased to grant blessings in response to prayer. How beautiful to see it. And here we see it. When Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. As the hand was held up, so the power of God worked and grace flowed 
It's so evident, isn't it? They were fighting, but the strength was not theirs. It was of grace. When the hands went down, instantly the tide of battle turned. Instantly, the greater skill and confidence and aggression of their adversaries, instantly their better armor and armaments had their effect, and the tide of battle turned. But when the rod was uplifted, then the people prevailed. It was of grace. Grace flowed, and the power of God worked. That's prayer being answered. And so it is in the fortunes of the church of Christ. When prayer is offered, grace flows. When the Lord's people continue in prayer, so the blessing comes. Oh, friends, have we let our hands hang down? Have we become discouraged and disheartened in this work of prayer? Oh, have we not seen it ourselves in seasons of greater prayer? How grace flowed, how the Lord worked, how times of blessing were known. And when the Lord's people grew cold and stale and formal, then lesser times of blessing were known. Haven't we seen that even at communion times when the Lord's people are more earnest in their prayers? What sweet blessings are received in response? And then all too often we sink back into the daily grind and everything becomes cold and ordinary again. Oh, let us hear the challenge of the word of God to lift up our prayers, to lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees it is the will of God, says the apostle, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So let us be men and women of prayer. Let us use the instrument of prayer to seek the blessing from our God. We've seen then the call to fight. We've seen, secondly, the call to pray. Let's see, thirdly, the call to triumph in faith. We're told, verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. All the glory is to God. There's none left for man in this scene. Is Moses not greatly honored here? Well, yes and no. Yes, his prayers were answered. But oh, his weakness was so evident he could not do it alone and so there's a lesson here the lord's people do not triumph alone we need one another true prayer is not a lonely exercise in which we hide away one from the other and engage merely in the secret exercises of the closet True prayer is a corporate thing. It is a united thing. It is for all the corpus, all the body of Christ. So yes, there is secret prayer. Let it be every day that we are in prayer. But there is also public prayer, united joint prayer. And the blessings of public prayer are greater than the blessings of of private prayer. The promises associated with it of the presence of God are greater. And so what we have here is a beautiful picture of public prayer because he, here we see the three elders of Israel united in this endeavor. Moses cannot do it alone. So Aaron and Hur will each contribute their strength to sustain him in his work. The strong will support the weak. 
Isn't it beautiful when the church of Christ is like that? When we have that love, that compassion one for the other, that we so unite in our efforts, that the, sp that the strong are upholding the weak, that we are praying one for another and keeping one another and seeking blessing upon one another on the road to Zion. That is what it should be. See how they love one another. That is the mark of the true church of Christ. And so we must pursue that love, that mutual support, one for another, the strong supporting the weak. But equally, it applies spiritually as well. The spiritually strong supporting the spiritually weak. Moses was weak in body, strong in spirit. He was the godliest man in Israel. He was the man with the deepest and profoundest experiences of God. He was a prophet such as had not been raised up and would not be raised up until the coming of Christ himself, one that had spoken with God face to face. And so here we see Moses the spiritually strong upholding weak, spiritually immature Israel. As this people fought, this people who were so full of doubtings and of fears that in each of the previous three chapters, we have seen them failing spiritually. Here now we see them victorious spiritually because upheld by the prayers of the spiritually strong. So is our salvation in Christ. All of grace, all of his strength, we trust in the mediator. We hope in his prayers and his prayers are effectual to secure the victory. Trust in Christ. Oh, he is a better mediator than Moses, a mediator truly without sin, a mediator who truly speaks continually with God face to face. We may safely trust in him. Under his prayers, we see the victory, verse 13, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. The victory won, the adversary driven off, for the Lord had granted the victory. And so all the praise, all the glory must go above, not to the Joshua down below, not to the Moses or the Aaron and her down below, but above. To God, it's so evident in all this scene. It's of God. And so we're told, Moses, verse 15, built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. The Lord, the great banner of his people. The Lord leading them into victory the Lord their strength and their inspiration to win for them the battle. Oh, dear friends, let us remember that. However sore the battle, however hard the fight, however dark, however painful your spiritual circumstances, yet God is still Jehovah Nissi. He is still the Lord, our banner, and there is safety and triumph, and eternal inheritance to be found in him. He has secured the victory already, and so we must but trust in him. Oh, dear friends, let me speak a word to any here who may be backslidden, to any listening or watching this later, who may have fallen deep into sin, who may have been beaten by the devil, deceived by his stratagems, overcome and overwhelmed. Consider this. Here we see in this passage, the Lord's people for a time overwhelmed when the hands, tired, exhausted, weary, hung down. 
Here we see God's people being overwhelmed and defeated by these hate-filled, satanic adversaries. But there was a reversal. But there was a turning of the tide of the battle. God was able to do something awesome in this scene. And so no matter how much the devil has led you astray, no matter how far you have fallen, no matter how degraded your current circumstances, morally speaking, may be, there is still hope. If you will turn your eyes to Jehovah Nissi, if you will lift your view to the mediator upon high and trust afresh in him, there is restoration. There is strength for the battle. There is assurance of final victory for those who are found trusting in him. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Now is the time for faithfulness. Now is the time to persevere and to the end, trusting in his strength. He is able and he is the hope and help of his people. Oh, let us look to him and find that he will secure to us the victory. Let all the Lord's people take confidence in their master. Here we see Christ, the great intercessor. Here we see Christ, the prophet, proclaiming his power and his faithfulness. Here we see Christ, the king, leading in victory. Three offices, one great mediator. Let us see that in Christ, salvation is secure. And so let us come to him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let the Lord's people so believe and trust in him. Let any hear or listening on the recording who know not yet this Savior, let them hear that he is still the Lord, the banner that he is still the Lord who has secured victory, that his arms are still held out to all who will come, that there is mercy and compassion to be found in him. And if we will but lift up our eyes to that son of man who is lifted up in the preaching of the gospel, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you will but trust, you will find that he is a faithful Savior. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The same Christ calls you this day to come to him. So come. And so find for yourself the salvation of the Lord. May God be pleased to bless his word in our hearing. Let's come before him in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we honor thee. For thou art faithful that promised, and thou hast promised salvation to such as come to thee. Grant then that we might be found looking unto Jesus even this night. Grant that we may be found full of that faith which is his gift. Grant that he would truly be to us the author, the finisher of our faith. O Lord our God, save us, we pray. Turn us from sin. Lead us in righteousness. Humble us. Break us. That we may be remade and renewed in Christ. Teach us that there is forgiveness to be found with him and plenteous redemption. Teach us that there is triumph and victory even for a failing people. 
And so our God, with all our sin, with utter unworthiness, with a deep sense of our own inadequacy, oh, this night look upon us in love and accept us in the Beloved and draw us unto him. Continue, we pray, pardoning our many sins and leading in thy ways. In Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Let us conclude. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.